Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Cheryl Finley, and I'm the director of the Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective. It's my great pleasure this afternoon to welcome Amy Sherald and Kylan McMorrin, who will be addressing us in this career conversation about the collaboration and work together between an artist and a studio manager. Um, I think that uh, just in terms of introductions, uh, the one, one thing that I would like to point out is that Amy Sherald um, is a proud Clark Atlanta University uh, graduate. And um, of course, we all know her for her beautiful and important uh, portraiture, especially the work that she's done at the National Portrait Gallery, but also in lifting up um, important figures of our time, including uh, Breonna Taylor and, and many others. Um, and I also wanted to just say that we're so happy to have you here today um, to discuss your collaboration and to share with us uh, the kind of pathways that our students might be able to take to, uh, to do the kind of work that you both do uh, together and, and separately. So I'm gonna disappear um, and uh, welcome you to the floor and thanks so much again for taking the time to share with our students during virtual career week. Take care. Hey, Amy. Hi, Colin. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, Cheryl, I just wanted to, to uh, remind everybody that I did my um, I did my senior show at Spelman College. So um, I kind of feel like I went to Clark and Spelman together and graduated from both, even though I got <laughs> three from CAU. Um, so welcome to Studio Management 101. Um, Colin and I are just going to go over um, some of the aspects of the job. And as Cheryl said, it really is a collaborative process. Um, there's many different um, ways to go about it. I have a small studio, so I only have um, three employees and that includes myself. Um, but there are larger studios out there where, you know, as a studio manager, you're managing up to um, 10 people, 15 people, 20 people. Um, and sometimes this job does um, borderline personal assistant because um, at the end of the day, your job is to make sure that the artist has the ability to stay in the studio and to not worry about um, all the little aspects of like the functioning of the studio. Um, so for me, I first hired a studio manager when I um, moved my studio from Baltimore to New Jersey. Um, and therefore had to expand my business. And it was my first time working with a studio manager. So it was really, um, I was learning what I needed while um, Kylan was trying to figure that out at the same time. It was, it was the first year was just kind of, um, we, we just kind of <laughs> winged it, but now we have, we have more of a process and Kylan functions um, really as a studio production manager so she does a lot of jobs i mean she basically runs the studio but then she also um assists me in um in painting when i need that as well um so i guess we can start with like the the day-to-day -day. so we'll, we'll run down the job description and then we can hit each point and talk about each point yeah, so I mean, generally, I mean, the job entails just anticipating the needs of the studio, right? So in a more like minute level, it's it's ordering supplies, it's making sure we have enough of what we need for upcoming work and like foreseeing that. Um, and it's just a lot about like communicating, right? Talking with Amy and like understanding what her needs are in the studio, right? Um, so, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, given what's going on with an upcoming show, it's about, you know, ordering canvases, um, just kind of day to day, we're planning out, you know, weeks in advance, like what we need to get done by when. Um, Production schedule. Yeah, production schedule so, and just sort of like understanding how long certain aspects of a painting are going to take and what we'll need to like get it done basically. Yeah. So we'll sit down like, you know, I'm, I'm in LA right now. I have a show opening on March 20th 
And so in September, um, or maybe August, we sat down and we um, made a timeline. So, so Kylan will um, make a timeline of the production of the work. And um, based on the size of the canvases, based on when we're able to order the canvases and when we can receive them, um, if I need her to, she will have to be my proxy and um, you know, go to Brooklyn to meet with the person that makes the canvases to make sure that, they're, that their specs are correct and have a conversation to make sure that, that they're arriving in the way that I need them to. She will organize the arrival of the stretchers and be there for me when I can't be there you know, while they're putting them together in the studio. Um, she will um, organize and schedule the models for the paintings um so that I don't have to I don't have to do that like I find the models I'm like this is what we want and then she will line them up and have them show up and then be there to meet them um those are the beginning processes and then we also decide once we take the photographs of the work okay how much paint are we going to need and Kylan has to decide okay so if we're doing three paintings and um, we have three blue skies, then we're probably gonna need to order 25 tubes of cerulean, ultramarine blue, titanium white, and whatever we need to make sure that we have all the colors that we need for all the works. And then she has to stay on top of that and on a weekly basis, go back and check in to make sure that we stay stocked up on everything because the last thing that you want is to be working in the studio at three o'clock in the afternoon, and then you run out of paint and then you have to drive 30 minutes in the middle of the day to go pick up paint. Right. Um, it's really a job that you have to have an attention, um, be able to pay attention to detail. You have to have an intuition as to um, being able to figure out a moment in the moment and like think about and problem solve and think about what, what, what needs to be done um, to simplify everything. I mean, I think what's, what's really important for me that she does is that she's able to um, cut down on steps, you know? So whatever, what, shorten, shorten the process from beginning to end in whatever capacity, whether it be, um, it, it could be in anything, not, not painting, but just in, but, it, but just in general, you know? Yeah, like scheduling whether be, things come up. There's like problems that will naturally come up in the process of production, right? And it's just about making things as seamless as they can be and like anticipating like what those problems could be and like just thinking fast and trying to fix them. I don't know, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it helps to have a background in art because a lot of those conversations that, that we have, I mean, I think um, I do a lot of talking out loud and I run all my ideas you know, through my assistance, like just to get some pushback. And sometimes, um, sometimes they have really great ideas. And sometimes, you know, when you ask somebody for advice and they give you their advice, it solidifies, it only just solidifies that the decision that you made was the right decision. So I think it's always good. I think like, you know, two heads is always better than one when it comes to um, a studio practice. Yeah, it's like essentially the job is an extra set of eyes, right? Because Amy's like, very much she knows what she wants and what she's doing but it's like it's just sort of like affirmations throughout the process I think and just um I don't know again like just the constant sort of conversation when it comes to like day-to-day -day stuff and then when it comes to maybe like more conceptual aspects of the work and like visual sort of cues or something like that mm. uh, yeah yeah and what's the next um um, I guess like another aspect of my job is um, I do a lot of work with Photoshop and sort of helping Photoshop backgrounds or different color options for the works, right? Just sort of key decisions for the work. Not that I'm making the decisions, but that, you know, I'm helping facilitate sort of just making, just giving options for that. Making it um, easier for me to make the decision basically. So when I, when we, when we photograph the work, I say, I think I like the color blue for the background, but Kylan will then give me <clears throat> 20 options to look, 
to look at to help me figure out what color I want the background to be. So she'll give me blue, but then she might like get creative and like, you know, make up some other colors. And sometimes that might trigger me to, to do something right. different. Totally. Um, another big, I mean, organization, like as we've been speaking, is sort of like an over, overarching thing that's really important. Um, we have a sort of tedious, like, uh, color archive that has to be maintained and updated. Um, so just really trying to like keep on track with that. Um, sometimes we'll have interns come and sort of overseeing and they'll help out with our digital archive, which is essentially um, just using color swatches, Pantone color swatches. Um, and anyway, so, you know, overseeing interns and, and things like that generally. Um, well, yeah, when we do have interns, Kylan is the one to organize um, what their day-to-day -day life is going to be like in the studio so that um, I'm, inter I'm interacting with them, but it's limited or it's just when I want to so it doesn't interfere with my work day. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, like, like you said, like the job isn't in specifically being a personal assistant, but it is like inherently just very personal and that... I'm working with you and you're working on your body of work, right? And that's like the most personal aspect of like your reality. So it's like about being sensitive to that. And again, I keep using the word like anticipating, but like just anticipating your needs and like making that just flow as, you know, as nicely as it can, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, you know, prior to working for Amy, I worked for a um, few other artists and I, I think that it's an interesting sort of like position to find yourself in and it's really like gratifying um, but it was just a slow process of working in, in various studios. Um, I worked as a personal assistant before which was actually super helpful and like understanding just communication with you know scheduling and all these things. Um, and then I, I moved to New York about two years ago and, and um, started working for Amy just in the studio and I'm now helping you know, manage production, which has been really, um, really lovely. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's about sort of like taking a step back and really like understanding how somebody, how somebody operates, right? Again, like going back to like the idea of it's a very personal situation because I'm watching her, her studio mannerisms and like, ideas and, and that's special so um yeah yeah um so yeah I don't know what's the um let's see um so I also have um someone who solely um uh, answers my emails for me I've kind of divided the job in two um and so Moselle works for me part-time. Because I have a small studio, I don't exactly need a full-time studio manager. So that's why Kylan's job description is kind of, um, it runs the gamut. She kind of like does so many things uh, around the studio. Um, Moselle is a um, art history major. Um, she went to Courtauld in London and she's a really good writer. And so I find that to be very useful. Um, I did have a studio manager for one year. And um, one thing that I realized I needed was somebody who was able to, for example, if I get three or four interview questions for a blurb in a magazine or something like that, um, Moselle has the capacity to be able to um, answer those questions within context um, as if I was answering them. And um, some studios are, are busier in that capacity than others. Like I get a lot of um, media requests. I don't know, I, I mean, I get a lot like 30, I don't know, 30 a month or something like that. And so um, sometimes that can be overwhelming and it, um, it can pull me away from my practice. And that's something that, um, you know, I just don't want to happen. So it helps that uh, she's a really strong writer and has a strong um, 
art history background um, because she's able to take over in that capacity when I feel overwhelmed and communicate. You know, she knows about my work. She knows what I'm doing. She knows what the work is about. And she has the language to be able to um, write when I need her to write. And that's, you know, really very valuable. Um, you have to know how to speak to people and how to engage people. Um, and not the way that you would, but she relays messages in the way that I would because she's speaking for me. Um, and so, you know, I like them, my emails to be um, very polite and animated because I want people to feel as if, you know, I'm happy to hear from them and I'm very happy to respond. Um, I want their interaction to, you know, with, um, I call my studio Kim Folk Studio with Kim Folk to, you know, to feel positive in every aspect, every aspect, even if it's, you know, just um, our, our regular day to day. Um, she's the person that corresponds with the artist liaison that I have at my gallery. Um, so at Hauser and Worth, I have a director, I have a deputy director and I have an artist liaison. And that artist liaison communicates with Moselle who will therefore relay any information to me. And um, I can shoot it back up the ladder or I can reach around and um, have that conversation with my liaison myself. But it, it just helps expedite um, everything that's happening in the studio to make sure that, you know, emails get answered at an appropriate time um, and that, um, the little, the little decisions that she has to make about, um, you know, for example, getting ready for the show, they're like, what kind of wall type do you want? Like, what do you want it to look like? Um, they can, she, she kind of already knows, like if they send something that I'm not going to like it and that, you know, she checks in with me, but for the most part, she could just go back and say like, she's not going to like this. We think it should look this way. Um, and so both Kylan and Moselle have the, um, the agency to speak up for me. And I've, that probably becomes easier. Like the longer they, they work for me, the more they'll be able to understand how I would think and react to something and, and um, be able to take that, you know, the, the smaller decisions off of my plate. Um, sometimes the studio manager will travel with the artist if they go somewhere to give a talk just to be the the in-between person um you're pretty much there for every meeting that the artist has um COVID has obviously changed that so a lot of things are happening over zoom but for the most part everything that I do that person shows up there with me um if I need to get home they're organizing my ride home um, if I have to be on stage somewhere and give a talk, or if I'm giving an interview, they make sure that it doesn't go over and you have to be able to speak up and be comfortable speaking up and saying, you know, sorry, like we offered, you know, we're, we're give, we gave you guys 30 minutes So 30 minutes is up. Thank you so much for asking her to do this and, you know, be really diplomatic about it so that, um, my time doesn't get eaten up. Cause I'm like really, really nice. And I always will go over time. If I feel like, you know, someone's benefiting from it, then I'll be like an hour later, I'll still be like trying to answer questions when I really need to be moving on to something else. Um, anything and everything, you know, we need new lights in the studio. Kylan makes sure that she communicates to the electrician, that she shows up when they're there. Um, she orders food for the studio to keep in the refrigerator. Um, and yeah, most importantly, she's just there as a second pair of ears, second pair of eyes, and, um, you know, just really important in, in keeping the machine going because I'm oftentimes pulled away and you have to have a proxy there to make sure that things are happening the way that you need them to happen. Right, yeah. When there's like a show coming up, such as right now, Amy's like constantly dealing with press interviews and all these things. So it's just about like trying to like maintain some sort of like normalcy and like I guess um, and yeah like to what you were speaking to it's like when you 
are working for an artist and you're dealing with people out in the world, you know, for them, you're representing them. So it's important to like really just maintain, um, you know, proper face or something, you know? Um, yeah. Um, I think that's it in general, as far as pay, um, it can depend on who you're working for. I can say if you're working for a blue chip gallery artist, and this is probably gonna be the artist that can, that can afford to pay you a salary. Um, if you were, uh, let's see, um, emerging artists, like in the beginning, like maybe your salary, depending on the sales of the artist, could, you could just get paid hourly, like you could get paid, I don't know, $15 an hour. Yeah. Um, what did you get paid when you worked in LA? When I was in LA, I was getting paid 25 an hour, which is pretty, pretty good for being an artist studio assistant. Um, and then moving to New York, I was working for another artist and was only getting 15 an hour. Um, and it was just, you know, it's a, it's kind of a hustle and it just, it just depends, you know, who you're working with and what their comfortability is in, in paying, you, you know, like anything. Um, but yeah, then not long after I was working with you. Um, yeah. And if you, you can prove your, go ahead, what? Oh, I was just going to say you're very generous, you know, and I, I don't think that that is, um, it's very special. It's not super common that an artist is like willing to pay and, you know, give health insurance, which is another really big, important thing, obviously. So um, I don't know, it's not the luck of the draw, but, you know, if you work long enough for somebody, or you happen to meet somebody where the fit is just right, um, it's, you know, it's great. What were yeah, you I mean, if I find good people, then I want them to stay. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I do pay pretty well. I mean, it's according to my um, budget and sales, but um, I know studio managers that make $50,000. I know studio managers that make $70,000, $80,000. And I know studio managers that make up to $150,000 a year. Um, like I said, when you're working for blue chip artists that you've been around for a while, like there's probably a good chance that, you know, if you've really forged that strong working relationship that um, they might, you know, give you a percentage of the sales every year or something like that. Um, I've come up with a profit sharing plan so that if you're working for me um, every year that you work for me, you are 25% vested into, um, getting a print so that at the end of four years, you get a print. And so like, that's part of the, yeah, kind of like retirement plan or just savings, you know, it's something that you can have It's a liquid asset. You can keep it. Or if you want to buy a house or you need to pay for your wedding, then you have that there, you know, along with like whatever, um, small 401k plan I'll be putting together in the next couple of years like that right. all that stuff has to grow as 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 my studio grows so you don't want to overspend um but that's also like such a an anomaly like the situation it's so generous of you like I would just say like most artists are not as generous in like being able to do that and wanting to like do that it's pretty amazing I would say I mean, yeah. as a person working for you and having yeah, had and I think that's because I, I had to work as a waitress for so long that I, you know, I know what it, um, the feelings of insecurity right. that you have when you're working a job and you can't quite make ends meet. Um, and when you show up to work for me, you know, like I want I want you to be focused and happy and feel like, you know, like you're living your best life. And I think that's really yeah. important. And, you know, you, you kind of pay for what you get essentially. Yeah, it's yeah. great. I love working for Amy, just so everyone knows. <laughs> All right, so does anybody have any questions? I don't know where the, let's see, Q and A. Um, um, they wanna know about your academic and professional background, Kylan, how you got into studio management. Um, well, I went to, I'm from Los Angeles, I went to, um, I went to Art Center College of Art and Design and I got a BFA. And then I just started uh, 
NIFA, I will say, uh, New York Foundation for the Arts is an amazing tool if you're looking for work in an arts related field. That's how I that's how I met Amy. Um, I worked for another artist in LA and that's how I met her um, in LA. Um, but yeah, so I was working for an artist in LA, decided to move to New York, through a friend, got a job working for another artist and then through NIFA, started working with Amy about two years ago. And I was uh, in the studio initially and then um, over the last two years, um, now I'm managing production with Amy. Yep. Um, as I think this is Andrea Chung. Hey, Andrea. Um, so hey Amy, do you utilize your studio manager or assistance when it comes to applying for grants applications or if you're fabricating a project out of materials that you aren't well versed in, for example, mold making, etc.? cetera? Um, I would say uh, I could, yes. Um, when I was applying for grants, I couldn't afford a studio manager, but I guess if I was applying for grants and I had someone um, like Moselle that was a really great writer, then it would probably be a, would have been a more collaborative process when it came to that, if they um, have that skill. Um, and as far as fabricating a project out of materials that you aren't well versed in, I think as a team, when we're doing something that we all don't know, like we all just sit down and put our heads together and we're all doing research on that. Um, there's a project I'm working on now where I have to figure out how to suspend a motorcycle and nobody knows how to do that. So we've all had to sit down and, you know, make calls and make calls and try to figure out like how, to, how to make this work. Like we're not engineers. We aren't familiar with motorcycles. Um, but you know, then they become your, your kind of like research team in a way. Right. Um, um, how long did it take for you both to find a good working flow where you became confident and comfortable with each other? I would say like working with Amy, she's pretty immediately like comforting and like lovely. So it, the comfortability was there, but I think like with any relationship, developing trust and like understanding how best to communicate with each other takes time, right? But yeah. I would say a year. Yeah, I would say like- I would give it a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you really learn in the day to day. Like you just, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, some people meet their soulmates and they get married in a week, but like most relationships take time. And, you know, <laughs> it, because that kind of bond and workflow comes through working through um, issues in the studio together. And then you get, then you get to understand like how they think. And I get to see like how she performs. And then we, you know, that's, that's really um, how that happens. So it, it, it yeah. does take time, but, but initially, um, you know, Kylan had a very um, high level of professionalism that I really appreciated. And so um, I think it, it, it has to start, it has to start there. Yeah, I would, I would say um, Andrea, you asked about insurance. Um, I use um, Oscar Health, which is, I believe, uh, New Jersey State's um, self-employment insurance, I think. But I'll follow up with you on that. I'll Private insurance, but yeah. Um, let's see. Ann Smith asked, what, what keeps you grounded? How do you define grounded? Um, what keeps, I don't think I've been grounded in five years. <laughs> I'm all over the place. Uh, I think just, I don't know, for me, just like showing up every day and working through my day and getting it done. Like for me, like showing up keeps me grounded. If I don't show up, then I'm, I don't feel connected to anything. So I just stay tethered to my work um and make that the most important thing yeah and i think that keeps me grounded um cheryl finley do most studio managers have a background as practicing artists or do they sometimes come from curatorial art history business backgrounds i would say um i would say some of them i was like i don't know i really don't know but i would say 60 percent are could have been art majors yeah but I think what's most important um, is, um, where'd your question go? 
I don't know, it disappeared. What's I mean, more I, important is the, I think it's good to have an art background because you have to understand the language and um, you have to understand the vernacular of like of these situations. And the gallery dynamic, I think is really important understanding like how that works. Um, especially when you get to the, to these, you know, um, higher level galleries. So I think it's important. Um, I have not worked with anybody that has a specifically a business background. I can see the benefits of that um, because my partner is a, he has an MBA and I will sometimes, you know, go to him for advice, but his world, his corporate business world is, is still very different than the art world although you're able to pull some of those, um, some, of the, some of the tools that he has, I'm able to use those tools, but I still think the worlds are a little bit different. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it is helpful like to your, what you're saying, like having an art history background, just understanding contextually how to talk about work that's in the studio is really helpful. Um, and I think also have, being a painter myself, like in my own practice, having that and working in the studio, you just have an understanding of like materials and like how long, just like technical things, how long something's gonna take to dry or like what, just in scheduling, what we really need to have happen. Um, yeah. And again, like if, if uh, I don't have a full-time studio manager, so when it, when it comes to just like being a studio manager, you're, um, you're also handling the books. So then like the business background would, might, you know, might, um, might really work in that respect. Um, I have a bookkeeper that does my books once a month, but if I had a studio manager, they would, they would be the one that was, that would be handling expensing everything every month. So I have a, a business credit card and I have a business debit card and everything goes on those two cards. And then every month, everything has to be reconciled so that when we give our um, annual report to our CPA to do our taxes then everything has to be accounted for. So you are working with numbers um, and things like that. So I think it's, you know, you have to know how to use Microsoft Excel um, and you have to know how to use um, QuickBooks. Um, I think that's really important. But then again, like it's about art. So having an art background is like really important. The other stuff you could probably learn on the job, but yeah. um, if you don't know that much about art, I think it makes the communication difficult, even with studio management when it comes to um, relaying messages and just having conversations with um, it could be with a museum director, uh, initial conversation about, you know, uh, a piece being loaned or something like that. You know, there's, there's, um, conversations that where just having that familiarity is important. Yeah. Um, well, would you talk about your recent purchase of your portrait of Brianna Taylor? Um, so, you know, I, 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 uh, took that commission, um, solely because Tanahasi Coates was behind this um, this um, edition of the van of that Vanity Fair. And you know, the cover came out, the painting was in my studio. Um, and I had to figure out what to do with it. And there were museums that were reaching out to buy it, like the the one museum that everybody wants their painting in. And I was like, I can't, you know, there's some things in life that you just can't do, like you have to make the right decisions. And so um, after much thought, I, you know, like when I, when I was talking to my, um, to my gallery, I was like, I have to take myself out of it. I have to take the art world stuff out of it. I have to take, you know, everything out of it. And it just has to be like, we have to pretend like we're having this conversation while sitting in the room with Miss Palmer, realizing that her daughter has been dead for less than a year. So like, what would be the appropriate thing to do? Um, I felt like it was something that, not that it's not an art piece, but I don't, you know, I don't, 
I don't relate to it in that way. Um, and I felt like it should be something that should be experienced by the people and codify and really codify that moment. Um, and it could become a part of the artist circle narrative in a way. Um, but I just, you know, I felt like the, I call it the Blacksonian or NMAC and the speed were just the appropriate homes for it. And um, I didn't realize that a painting could be co-acquired, but in the process of trying to figure out how to do both of those things um, and knowing that I had a relationship with the Smithsonian and, and what it could do and how it could live within that institution, but then also be a part of, of her own community in, um, in Louisville. So um, I am uh, friends with um, Kate Capshaw and uh, Steven Spielberg and from the unveiling, uh, the Michelle Obama portrait and which just casually talking to her about it. And um, she reached out to Darren Walker and Darren Walker was like, this is an amazing idea. So they jumped, they jumped behind it and, and here we are, we, we made it happen. So I can't, I'm still working out the logistics of like what this edu educational program is gonna look like. Um, and that will probably come out in a, in a month or so. Everything hasn't been solidified yet. Um, have you ever had a museum want to collect your work and ask you to send in a piece first to show acquisitions committee? I have not. I'm not sure I would do that. I think if they want to see it, I don't know if this, yeah. I wouldn't do that. Like instinctually, I'd be like, no, like if you want to come see it, the acquisition, the acquisition committee can, can see it digitally, but um, I'm not sure. Like that's the, kind of, that's the kind of conversation that you would have with your gallery and your gallery would be able to best direct you. But I honestly don't send anything anywhere unless it's paid for, <laughs> just, on, just on general principle. Um, what was it like? Let's see. What was it like to be a student at CAU? Do you have any advice for students who are enrolled in fine arts program at CAU Morehouse Spelman? Um, I was all over the place when I was Clark until I changed my major to art and found Arturo Lindsay. Um, so I had a, I I was one of those students that wasn't like super focused. I have to admit. Um, I had big ideas of what I wanted to do and I wanted to start there and not here. So I had like a lot of, like, I was always like butting heads. <laughs> if, I, if they wanted, if I took sculpture and they wanted us to like make little sculptures, like I wanted my first sculpture to be like a seven foot metal, something that I like <laughs> welded and I'd even never, never even welded before. <laughs> um, but I think in most educational situations, you have to make the most of it. Um, you get into, you get in, what, what you put into it is what you get out of it. Um, and I think being at Spelman for me, and I say that because I took all my classes there, was like, you know, one of the best opportunities that I had um, and really, you know, jump-started everything that I did. And I think this, this program, this curatorial program is going to be in a, real, a really amazing um, have a really amazing um, legacy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it was great to like have painting class with Morehouse students, Spelman students, CAU students. Um, I appreciated the fact that, you know, there were all different, like there was biology majors in my painting class along with, um, you know, art majors, because I really think that if you're gonna get, I don't really believe in like getting an art degree I think that you should take all the classes that you need like painting drawing art history take all those things but then also make sure that you're getting a well-rounded education which is why I say like I don't think you should go to an art school for undergrad I feel like you should go to a liberal arts college because all of the um all of the knowledge that you get from like all these different kinds of classes um uh the humanities and um you know, sociology, African-American studies, these are the classes that really build the foundation to your vocabulary, which help you create the work that you want to make. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, 
tech tools or analog organizational tools to manage production schedule and studio operations? Um, um, I think it's pretty analog. I think it's just a lot about like writing out lists, writing things out on the bulletin. We have a little board. We like to write things out, but we both- I'm a whiteboard see, person. I have to yeah. see. Just see it, check, do it, check it off, communicate that we've done it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, are there are there any certifications or trainings that I found helpful in work as a studio manager? Um, no, I wouldn't say. I mean, I would just say with anything, it's it's just sort of being present when you're there, watching. You know, specifically with Amy, just like just watching how she keeps her studio and how she you know maintains her practice and sort of um, reacting to that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think yeah. it's just I think it's, um, the environment. I, I really feel like, so what I'm learning is like this, uh, it's really about network when it comes to getting this job. It's like, it's not really like about a certification. It's, it's, um, it's really about knowing people. And I think that's why it's really important that, and just being aware that it's there. Um, I, as far as I know, I mean, I think maybe, I know Theaster, Gates and Titus Kafar, like I think they have like black studio managers, but for the most part, it's not something that um, I see us doing. And I, and, I, and, I, and I think it's because like, it's just not something that's like on the radar. So I feel like um, just, you know, networking, um, checking NIFA, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and just asking around for people, uh, asking around people if they know anybody who like needs assistance. And it's, you know, it doesn't always start off. Like when Mazelle started working for me, I couldn't exactly afford a studio manager. Um, you know, so I was just paying her a thousand dollars a month because that's all I could afford. And it was like, you know, a 25 hour a week job, you know, but if you, start if you're willing to work with an artist in the beginning stages of their career and you have a vision for you know what they're doing then that's like you know a good way to get in like even being a virtual assistant you know it's like um that you don't have to you don't have to necessarily be there and be present in the studio every day as a studio manager to um manage the the functions of the studio because a lot of it is just sitting down in front of your computer and answering emails and then communicating with the artist. Um, um, Jordan Barron asks, how do you hope your work impacts the art world or even the world at large? Do you see a need for change in the art world? Can we say it again? How do you hope your artwork impacts the art world or even the world at large? Oh. Well, I'm not going to answer those kind of questions today, <laughs> mostly because this is about Let's the see. job. Um, uh, how has technology affected your practices as artists? Well, let's see. What is production works, other experts that we work, shipping with Um. Well, I think uh, one thing that I use in the archiving is, um, you want to tell them about ArtSmart? Yeah, so we use a program called ArtSmart. Um, it's just a, it's an online database of the work. It has, you know, high def images of the work and dimensions, just any specific details. Um, and I know that for other artists, you know, it just, it's, it's just really helpful. Um, if the, you know, the larger your body of work is, the more complicated it, it is in like tracking everything down and, and getting images ready for certain things for like press releases or something like that. So we use ArtSmart, uh, which is a monthly, I think you pay monthly for it, um, but it's just a database system. That's really yeah. great. It's a cloud where you can store all of your images. You know, they're gonna be there. If something happens to your laptop, you you know, you know you have a safe space. So it's like, it's it's in the cloud. Yeah. Um, I mean, and technology just definitely streamlines everything. Yeah. And we also use like a, we use Google Drive quite often, right? Just so that everyone, I mean, it's a little simpler um, in its format, but um, yeah. 
I mean, as far as shipping, that's something that the gallery handles. Um, I'm not sure of like what the galleries use as far as technology when it comes to managing us, their artists. Right. Um, partnerships, brands, and collaborations. Um, I just, I only collaborate in things that I believe in and things that I feel like will benefit um, not me, but other people. Um, Firelay, uh, Firelay, um, do you see each other in person often? So normally I would see um, Moselle, she would come in like once or twice a week. So we have it in person, but since, um, since COVID, I haven't seen her at all. We just do everything on FaceTime now and it's, it's fine. It works. Um, and if she needs to show up somewhere, then, you know, she'll show up if, if there's like some kind of meeting or something, but for the most part, I think it's possible to do virtually. Although I did have an office for my studio manager, um, so that they could come in. Cause sometimes, you know, if you're like me, like you gotta be in a space if you wanna get it done. I, I don't work from home very well. Yeah. Love you too, Fairley. Mm -hmm. um, is there a network of studio? Do you share some of these things? Um, um, I don't know. I can get back to you on that, Cheryl, whether there's a network of studio and production managers. Um, I'll ask around and see um, whether they have a support group or not. If they don't, they probably need one. <laughs> but um, I'll ask around and I'll get back to you. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's like a specific kind of codified network or not. Yeah, not that anything that I know of, I think it's mostly just, you know, word of mouth or fr through friends or friends of friends. Um, but that's a good question. Um, what else? How early in your career should an artist invest in general manager? Um, I think the right time to do it is when you feel like you're not able to be efficient and do it yourself and um, work in your practice. So like for me, it was obvious because like I had W9s that I hadn't filled out for talks that I did like eight months before and hadn't gotten paid yet, paid yet because I was just like, you know, so busy in the studio that everything else was just like pushed to the side. So I think, you know, um, You'll, you'll know when it's time because you just, you won't be able to handle everything on your own. Um, let's see, any more questions? I think that's it. I think that's it. Anything else? Um, oh wait, storage. What considerations do you take for the storage, including work that is sent back to you from exhibition or works not yet displayed? Um, in your studio, um, I have like a wall or a particular space. Right now I have a closet. I keep things um, wrapped loosely in an archive of material and just make sure that they're safe in a corner. I don't really have any kind of like special um, system. Yeah, we don't have, like when there's the, the, there's really just work in the studio prior to the show, right? Once the show, and when, when that's happening, it's hanging on the wall. Every night we'll take it down so that, you know, in case it would fall or something like that. But as far as storage, we don't really have that much storage for the work. I mean, we tend to just make sure it's in a safe space. And Yeah, uh, when it's not displayed, it's just in the studio when it's covered and um, away from anything that could damage it. Yeah. But if you feel like you don't have space in your studio, then um, I would, depending on the size of the work, like you might have to get a- um, Sort of like rack system, or something like that. Yeah, like a rack system or um, something where, you know, if you don't have the space here, you could like use some kind of space above and create like a loft system or um, a, a cooled um, storage system like at a facility or something like that. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, well. Yeah. What do you look for in an artist when you're deciding whether or not to work for them? 
Which question are you reading? Um, this is to you, Kylan, from Andrea. What do you look for in an artist when you're deciding whether or not to work for them? I'm curious about what you consider best practices so that you have your own time for your own work. I mean, that's a good question. I think that, you know, trying to find the balance of maintaining your own studio practice while working for another artist can be complicated at times. Um, but it's just, for me, just about um, setting aside just that if, if one day a week to maintaining that practice. Um, I've been lucky in the artists and, and having the artists that I've worked for, um, they've all been pretty like generous. And like, I think it's also about like establishing boundaries for yourself um, and for the artists. I think it's just any sort of like, it's like maintaining any kind of healthy relationship. Um, it's like any other job, like technically your job doesn't, care about what you do when you're not at work and they don't really want to hear about it they just want you to show up and do your work so right. that's how the real world is I'm a little more empathetic but at the end of the day when it's time for you to show up you got to show up because this is what you're getting paid to do and that's like it's how you're eating and um you know I think that's how most artists um, we'll see it like they want people that are going to work for them that are will uh, that are like okay I'm ready for this to be my life like while I'm working for you because it's just it's just that kind of job it's not a job that you can sometimes I mean like it can be nine to five ish but sometimes when we're getting ready for a deadline like Kylie yeah, has worked, crazy. You worked really from crazy. 11 a.m to 11 a.m like it's 24 hours it doesn't happen very often but it does happen every year, probably four or five days a year. I don't know. Like, it's, so, I mean, you just, you have to be willing to, 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 to do that. You just have to be willing to like step up. And it has I mean, to I guess it's like, do your job, be there when you're there, obviously, like to Amy's point, but trying to set up, if you have a weekend, make Saturday your day or like dedicate specific yeah. time, you know, like she said, like to anything. Um, yeah. But yeah hey hey i'm back again so this has been such an engaging conversation and there were a couple of, of other questions that i saw kind of fly through the chat and one for you kylan um if you would be able to kind of share like what a typical day in the life of kylan mcmorin is in terms of the work that you do either for yourself or you know with in, in coordination with amy um, so one of the things that we try to do is give students like a sense of like, if this were, you know, your dream position, what, how can you imagine, you know, s s your day and, and the way that you would structure your day and the work that you want to do? Right. You mean like with your personal work and then work work or? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess a, a basic day, I usually get to the studio at like 8.45, 9, get there earlier before Amy's there, um, just to sort of tidy up, clean up, be there, be present. Um, Amy will come in around 9.30 or 10, depending on like scheduling. Um, and we kind of both just sort of, you know, obviously we're in communication throughout the day, but we have our our tasks for the day. It's like we, we kind of know go, going into the day what we're gonna be doing. And obviously that changes. Um, and you know, throughout the day emails will come up or if there's a show coming up and you know, a size of a painting needs to be figured out. It's her and I communicating about that and then me putting that order in and you know, just you know, staying on top of orders and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know, they're 8.45 to around six. Um, throughout the day, just conversations happen. I don't know, working, painting a bit, um, and then going home. And usually I don't like to work at nighttime. So I, if I were to set time aside for painting for myself, I would probably do it over the weekend, like on a Saturday morning or something like that. But I mean, everyone is different. So we would each have our own sort of modes of like operating our own selves outside of work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Most of, most of my former students that I like would hire as painting assistants don't want to work for me because they want to work on their own stuff and they realize like what the commitment is. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they're like in their studio as much as I'm in my studio. 
So it's like, it's, um, you have to be happy. Yeah, you have to be happy kind of like giving yourself a little less. You know, I think it's that, I think it's that decision of like, do I want to make, do I want to make a living and then make some work or do I want to make work? And I think you have for, uh, for, for long term, um, and those are the kind of people that I'm looking for, like for long term, I think, like I wouldn't want to hire anybody that had the same amount of drive that I had to be an artist. Right. Because I feel like it's going to eventually like, you know. It's like, it's that balance, you know, who are, and commitment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I think the the last question, this is like the best, well, I'm sorry, they're all great questions. All great questions. You all are amazing. And I mean, just a dynamic duo today. So thank you so much for sharing um, with, with our students, with our community. The last question is posed by Janiah Douglas, who is a junior art history major, curatorial studies minor. And she asks, how much does a studio manager shape an artist's career? Hmm. Um, they don't really outside of allowing the artists to do the work that they need to do. They don't really have any say so in decisions or anything like that. Um, yeah, I think it's just that the job is to like facilitate, facilitate like whatever the needs are of the studio to help it transition as seamlessly as possible and to like make Amy's studio practice just as, as it needs to be basically. Yeah, you're, you're a helping hand, right? For her, oh, yeah, and in a big way, I, I mean, like, that's half the battle. Like shaping the artist's career, like means giving the artist the time to work and to think about solely that. So it, it's, it's like, it's like creating also, space almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. it's like there's so many distractions in the day, throughout the day, and complications that arise. So it's about like helping to ease that and like let her do what she needs to do, basically. Right. right. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, I think last thing I just wanted to ask if there's any any words of wisdom or advice you'd like to share with our students or faculty. Just life advice. Yeah, um, keep going. I don't know. I always just say, wake up and do what the hell you want to do every single day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not happy, if I figure out what makes you happy. Um, yeah. And don't be afraid to... I mean, I, I wouldn't have been here had I made had I made decisions that um, if I had if I wasn't if I was risk averse, I wouldn't be here. So um, be smart, but also be courageous. Yeah, yeah. and be present too. I don't know. Yeah, be present. <laughs> Definitely be present. Yeah, be present. <laughs> that becomes a luxury after a while. Good. Good. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, Kevin. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Enjoy the day. Beautiful. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Amy. <laughs>